Hello everybody, you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest than each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We play unsigned and or independent music. And uh, we have an album review from Twangler Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed. It's been a while since uh, I've done one of these, so forgive me if I forget what is on the show. Uh, as always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Arch on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio on Dane dot cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk that's d-a-n-e dot c-o-b-a-i-n at wickhamsound.org.uk and i'm particularly keen to hear from poets performers musicians anybody with mp3s to share with stories to share local arts news don't hesitate to get in touch we're also repeated on monday nights on wickham sound we're on the wickham sound listen again itunes spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts and now it's time for us to head over to the Rye Light Zone and this week I have some poems that I wrote while I was away on holiday in Iceland. Uh, I'm your host, Enka Bain. These are poems from Iceland. Poems from Reykjavik. Who's Malzog Meningar? She's drinking Coca-Cola, he's drinking Sprite. The people are singing so good, so good, so good, except they shouldn't. The snow outside crushed to ice and a man shouts something about the apocalypse. We're not scared of zombies, even though the cold might stop them from decomposition. Window ledge guitars, better than my butterfly, my bumblebee. Not as good as the wolf, but the wolf needs new strings and is on the other side of the Atlantic. Shay looks sad, but she says she's only tired. I feel like I was punched under the stomach. Tomorrow, nature, the phenomenon and not the magazine. The wolves have eyes, 10,000 books and a couple of tote bags. Yesterday, live music. Today, live music. Tomorrow, live music. First world problems in the snow. Stop cancelling things, it's only the weather and not a celebrity caught in a Nazi salute or a streamer walking to deepfakes. I know if your car breaks down in the Icelandic countryside or you run out of fuel in the winter, you probably die or get frostbite. But I'm only here for two rotations and I don't want to miss what I came for. I came for love but it cost me money and the banknotes I got are mostly useless. Nowhere takes cash, it's card only and I'm worried about my bank account. Same story, different country. Snowbound. We almost died today. Not from the ice we kept slipping on or the snow falling from the roofs in the smoky bay of Reykjavik. Not from the cold, the biting wind that left my hands stigmated, looking like an eczema plague made me a zombie. Not by shifting tectonics, nor by being burned at the stake as a heretic, a cis white witch with a or a mother who left her baby on her doorstep. Not from the geezers bubbling from the ground, 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, so don't dip your hands in. Not in visitor centres or because of the weather, the coldest winter in 100 years. They say if you don't like it, wait 20 minutes and it'll change. Not from a computer, it's called a tolva. Not from the prophetess of numbers or her disciples. Not in a forest either. If you get lost in the woods, stand up, the trees aren't as tall as you are. Not from a horse or an Icelander, not from telling them you love their ponies. Not from the golden waterfall, either from going down in a barrel or hiking barefoot to Parliament. We almost died today. Our bus hit a crosswind in a blizzard and we skidded off the road into a snowdrift. And our bladders burst while waiting to be rescued. Steroid Cream A man's hands are the tools with which he marks the world, the automatic weaponry he fights his wars with. Without his hands, he's armless. He's a snow shovel on the beaches of Normandy. This man's hands are red with anger, anger at another man who took his sweet time at a photo booth. The skin is flayed like the Bolton's banner, fingers cracked and weeping like a patient on a psych ward. Like an honest politician, they hurt when they bend and also they're non-existent. There's nothing but pain and information. Those are some poems that I wrote while I was away in Iceland. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Hoger's Wolf with Aoife.
for a change in skies. Through the night, she generally schemes, reclining in cloudless climbs. Sky, mother to children of the holy land, priest is warrior of the secret hearts, mistress to Cocoon's life. She rode the storms from the winged isle through the valley of Westmore End. Ephraim is a storm.
That was Wait and Wonder by San Dimas, and before that we had Aoife by Hoga's Wolf. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to be joined now by this week's guest, who is the one and only Ronnie McFadden. Ooh, well, the first question is one that I ask everybody, which is, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Oh, the last book that I read... Um, gosh... Uh, well, I'm reading Stephen King's fairy tale right now, so cool. I can't remember the last one, but I'm deep into fairy tale and I love it. Awesome! I read that one myself. I, I think when did I think I got it for Christmas? So it's, mm-hmm. it's been pretty recent. I read that one myself. Um, so yeah, hopefully you keep on enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I listen to it. I listen to the audio when I go swimming and stuff. So I don't read them fast, but I listen to them every time I go to the go to the gym. Awesome. Cool. Brilliant. So obviously today I, um, I want to talk to you about books anyway. So uh, I thought a good place to start would be for you to uh, let us know a little bit about The Longest Trail. What's it about? How did it come about? That sort of thing. Um, well, when I was a teenager back in the 60s, 1960s, I worked for a man who had a pack station in the High Sierras. So a pack station is uh, a place where you can rent mules, horses, whatever, and they take you off up into the mountains hunting and all that. So I was a 14-year-old girl when I first met up with him and started working for him. And I was there for seven years. I lived there two winters all by myself on the desert, taking care of the horses. Um, and there were people in and out of my life at that point. Well, in 2003, we had kind of a reunion of, there were 30 of us there who had been, you know, together over the years back then. And somebody said there ought to be a book about this place. And then everybody looked at me. <laughs> so so that's kind of how it came about. I just kind of started writing down memories and trying to remember the horses and I did a lot of research on the pack station itself and the man who began it back in the early 20s, actually. And it soon became apparent that rather than being about the place, it was going to be about me at the place yeah. and my yeah. journey along that longest trail. Cool. Yeah. And you met, and, and you said so, I mean, over the years, you must have, you know, you must have worked with dozens if not if not hundreds of different horses you know do they have their own characters and are there any sort of horses in particular that, that stand out to you and you still think about today absolutely um they all have their own character i ended up having i think i i owned seven horses when i got married and then it quickly dwindled down to more manageable numbers mm-hmm. but there were a lot of horses that really stood out in my memory and they're written about in the book there i wrote the book in each chapter is a story in itself mm-hmm. and uh several of them are, are about some of the different horses cool and um so i, I from what i understand because i don't know a huge amount of horses so you, about horses so you're gonna have to kind of educate me here but um so there's the breed the appaloosas right um, what yep. can you tell us about that specific breed? And is that, you know, were all of the horses Appaloosas? Or no, 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 or... very, very few of them. Most of them were just grade, just grade horses. We didn't have any mules, like packs, most pack stations use mules. We didn't mm-hmm. have any, we used horses. Um, the Appaloosa I fell in love with when I, when I got my first Appaloosa, his name was Hell's a Poppin. <laughs> and he's written about in the book. He was a leopard Appaloosa. So the Appaloosa breed are the horses that have the spots on them. Mm-hmm. And they were developed by the Nez Perce Indians in the Northwest Pacific Northwest. And they're just a really stout breed. Um, you know, very stoic and stout and good for the mountains. They're actually good for just about anything. Mm. Cool. Awesome. And, um, you know, you've been doing some, I, so I checked out your social medias and you've You've been doing a few um, doing a few events as well. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us some of the events that you've been at recently. Um, well, I went to the Appaloosa Museum where I did mm-hmm. a book signing, and um, you know, because because there are Appaloosas in my book. If you can see the picture behind me, that's yeah. my Appaloosa that I have now. That's Romeo, <laughs> <laughs> and he's very beautiful. Um, but yeah, I went to the Appaloosa Museum and signed books and had a really good time at their Appaloosa Fest that they put on once a year i've done a few book signings i haven't done any any right here in idaho where i live 
but um, there might be a couple coming up. And interestingly enough, the Appaloosa is the horse of Idaho. It's Idaho's <laughs> state horse. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So in terms of the publication process, I wondered uh, who publishes your books and what's the experience been like so far? So I have two books. I wrote The Longest Trail first. And um, at the time, I was working for an equine veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And a story came along in the during the time I was riding the longest trail, and it was about a client's horse that was related to the racehorse Seabiscuit. And it was about a filly that was born. Her name was Josephine, and her mother died when she was four, four days old, and we found a nurse mare for her. And so we thought it would be good to write a children's book about love and death and hope and so that's that's josephine that's that book right there awesome yeah oh, i love so, it so that came about while i was doing the longest trail and that book was published by a, a local company where i lived in willets and it was underwritten by mendocino county farm supply because the whole book was for charity it went to foster camps and cancer camps and and it's still all money from that from that book is donated. Um, so then The Longest Trail came about. I finished it. It took me nine years to write it. And I self-published it through Amazon. Mm -hmm. It was first published in 2012. And then I met Stephen, Stephen Booth with Genius, and became friends with him through somebody else. And uh, when it came time for, I rewrote it, well, I didn't rewrite it, but I added to it and I added all the pictures in yep. it. And so Stephen did all that for me. And then he also put it in Kindle form and um, also the Josephine book he put in Kindle form for me. Cool. And then another friend, we did the audio book. Um, we recorded the audio book and I, re I narrated it. So, so it's available in all three forms. Cool. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Ronnie McFadden, and this is Annette Valentine with I'm Still Waiting. The first time I saw you, I could feel a connection. We gelled instantly, you weren't short of perfection. The way you softly talked to me, cherishing your company. When you don't call for a couple of days I start to get scared and my heart is ablaze With every passing embrace I want to quicken the pace The more I hear from you The more I want to see you I'm impatient, you're right, it's true But waiting is something I just can't choose Waiting is something I just can't chew If you told me you loved me, my heart would relax i wait for that moment to be stopped in my tracks When you're standing next to me I feel you're in a harmony My heart is pounding every time I feel the touch of your lips on mine I'm not wanting to leave Forever to believe The more I hear from you The more I want to see you I'm impatient, you're right, it's true But waiting is something I just can't chew Waiting is something I just can't chew Something I just can't chew. Waiting is something I just can't chew. Waiting is something I just can't chew. 
That was I'm Still Waiting by Annette Valentine. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time now for us to catch back up with this week's guest, who is author Ronnie McFadden. Awesome. And what are some of the differences for you for between writing, you know, um, the sort of, I suppose, adult memoir versus uh, children's fiction? What was what were some of the differences? I had a hard time with the children's fiction, and I have a, actually have a co-author because... I have a hard time forming dialogue, and here we were, you know, making dialogue for animated characters in this children's book. So it's it's kind of hard um, creating something. That's the way my mind works anyway. I can create things from my memories, but I have a hard time creating things out of the out of thin air. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And um, I'm I'm right in understanding uh, you're working on a feature film front, uh, project as well. Could you tell us about there, that? There is a adapted screenplay from the book. Um, I did not write the screenplay. I had um, a producer and a screenwriter both both wrote it, and yeah. it has been, it has been optioned, and that's about all I can say about that right now. <laughs> awesome, cool. Well, watch this space, <laughs> I suppose. Cool. And um, so you've mentioned on your website, I think, that The Longest Trail is sort of multi-award winning. Could you tell us about some of those awards? Um, It won the USA Reba. It's won 10 awards. So I'm trying to remember them all. But the most important one and prestigious one is the Will Rogers Medallion Award. That one is a really big one. Yeah. And then it's also won, let's see, I don't know if I have them in here. Yeah, I do. So I've got stickers in my books. <laughs> That's so cool. So it's won the Independent Press Award, the Reader's Favorite, um, the New York City Big Book Award, San Francisco Book Festival. It won an Epic Award um, just, and several ebook awards. Cool. Awesome. Um, and you've been on the radio before as well. So this isn't your, your first rodeo, if you can give the horse related pun i suppose um but what, yeah. what can you tell us about some of your previous uh, radio appearances um i was on a i was on a television a local television show for the josephine book and that mm-hmm. was probably back in 2012 and the only other radio show i've done is with leanne um uh, i can't remember her name she's on the mendocino coast um and her her local program down in uh in mendocino california Leanne Lindsay, her program. Cool. So and that how... was just an hour long. That was almost an hour long chat with her. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And and how else do you get the word out as well? So obviously we've mentioned that, and uh, I suppose word of mouth does quite well for you, right? Yeah, that's been the hardest part about self publishing. Well, I guess now in the market, every author does pretty much self, you know, marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the hardest part of it. So I did a lot of newspaper articles and once it started winning awards, it was easier because, you know, the newspaper said, Oh, it's a award winner. I'll mm-hmm. publish that. So, and of course it's about horses. So I had a, I worked at a horse bet office for 28 years. So I had quite a big audience there to share it with. And it's just kind of spread. It's probably well over 1500 copies now. Awesome. which is pretty good for a self-published book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't remember what the stats are, but it, it is, isn't it? Something like 90% of books sell fewer than 30 copies or something ridiculous. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. That's what Stephen told me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um. So in terms of the sort of the feedback you've received, what's the best bit of feedback that you've had from people? Um. I haven't had any negative feedback. Um. There's over 50 reviews on Amazon, I think, and they're all five star, but one, uh, there's a four star and uh, there's a three star one on that, but that was a personal thing with someone. Yeah, it (laughs) happens. uh, Yeah. Yeah. But all the reviews have been pretty good. And uh, most people said, can't wait for the movie or can't wait for a sequel. And that makes me feel pretty good. I haven't started writing a sequel, but there could be one. Awesome. So there's 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 space for it then. Well, I suppose as well though. You said it. I mean, if it took you nine years to do the first one. It's they're going to have a, yeah. a bit of a wait. It'll be like uh, people waiting for the next Game of Thrones book. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. Um, I'm working, so, on, a, oh, I'm working on a children's book now about um, a little uh, disabled girl down the street from me, 
who loves horses and then I moved in and have a horse and she was mm -hmm. just amazed and so I've had her on my horse twice now so I'm writing a children's book about her and her feelings about riding a real horse brilliant cool and you know in terms of people if people wanted to get involved with with horses whether it's horse riding or you know horse care or you know volunteering at stables etc what what would your advice be um look up your local stables in your area and see what they offer uh i have people contact me all the time looking for like horseshoers or places to board or all that so you just have to be familiar with your area if there's horses around find the stable that they're at and go ask if they need help. That's how I got started. Cool. Awesome. And you've been, you've been writing for a, for a while. I mean, do you have any other previous projects that you can tell us about? Like, and how did you get your start with writing? Because again, if, if, if that idea to write the book popped up and everyone looked at you, you must've had yeah. a reputation already as being somebody who liked to write. My reputation was writing angry letters to the editor of the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> that really was all my writing experience up to that point. It was just, you know, I'd get mad and I'd write something to the paper. And I, most of my friends knew that. So that's why I think everybody turned to look at me. Cool. <laughs> Would you ever consider uh, publishing those letters to the editor? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, I was thinking as well, it sounds like, especially with your children's books, you know, you're bringing a bit of, I guess, a bit of positivity and kind of enacting a bit of positive social change through what you're writing. And um, uh, well, for a start, I wondered whether that's a deliberate thing, but also, again, with this, with the letters to the editors, putting that out there would probably enact negativity. So it's probably the opposite <laughs> yeah. of what you want, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted to stay positive. The, the Josephine book just, it, there's a place for it in society and when I was trying to get it published I was shopping it around to editors and agents and they told me oh you can't write a children's book about death that just mm. will never fly and you know we all thought what you know children have their grandparents die their goldfish yeah. dies you know they and so it's been so I went ahead anyway of course and everybody that has a copy of it just cherishes it um you know, some kids sleep with it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then the disabled, you know, the book about the disabled girl down the street, I was involved with a, with a therapeutic writing program at um, the Ridgewood Ranch, which is the home of Seabiscuit. I used to keep mm -hmm. Romeo there in California. And uh, there's a big need for a, for a book like that to encourage kids that are different from everybody else, that they can be normal. They can ride horses. And Amelia, the little girl that it's about, she just goes on and on about, I never thought I could ride a real horse. And when yeah. I'm on that horse, I don't feel like anything is wrong with me. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're doing that book. I hope to have it done by the end of the winter. Cool. Awesome. Uh, it's funny. I So the last guest or the last interview that I did, um, I don't know what, what order they're going out in, but um, I was chatting to them and they've written a book. Um, it's about, uh, it's called Freddy Counts to Zen. And it's about a dragon uh, that gets angry and it's, it's designed to teach kids how to kind of cope with anger. Um, mm -hmm. And I think she had a similar thing, whereas like people wouldn't necessarily think like that's a good fit for a children's book. But it's a part of life. And it's a part um, of life. You know, and, and, and if you don't teach people at a young age how to deal with those kinds of things, like I was exactly. saying to her, they, you know, and it'd be the same with yours. If you don't teach kids at an early age to, you know, to understand death and to cope with it. They're just not going to be equipped and they're going to kind of become maladjusted adults. And That's I was right. saying that with this with this book about teaching kids to, you know, to cope with anger. It's like, well, the reason that we get so many like angry adults is because they were never taught as kids how to how to cope with it. So exactly it makes sense right. to, to hit them at a young age. And I love the fact that you're again, you're you're representing somebody as well and, and showing that the horses are for everyone. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the way I feel. You know, if we mm. don't teach them, they never they never learn yeah cool okay i've only got a few more questions a couple of these are um i suppose more about yourself and, and where you live so um i wondered uh what, what what was it about the sierra nevada that attracted you to it because you spent a lot of time in that that area well i live i was raised and grew up in altadena california which is about three hours south of where the pack station was mm -hmm. and so i met up with the man who ran the pack station because he had a stable in altadena right around the corner from me 
and I was a horse crazy girl at odds with my mother and I met up with I bought my first horse when I was 12 years old with my own babysitting money wow so I had a horse but then I met up with this guy who had a whole stable full of them so I went to work for him and then he was the one that that took me up to the pack station and I just you know i I could have been born a hundred years earlier and been perfectly happy. So yeah. that was just my spiritual space to to learn and grow. Oh, awesome. And um, what can you tell us about your connection to your uh, indigenous ancestors? Um, it's a spiritual connection. I don't have any any hard proof on paper genealogically, but it's a connection within that you know they spoke to me up there they yeah they you know i communicated with them and um i feel a part of them yeah. so may not have blood but i still feel a part of them yeah well and i suppose as well a lot of it is is like the value that the people place on the land and the horses as well it's kind of passed down from generation to generation and i suppose yeah. that you you know in a way you've kind of and you kind of mentioned this you could have been born a hundred years ago you've kind of I suppose taking part in like a long, a long tradition of you know looking after mm -hmm. these horses. Um, right. Do you, is that you know? Do you see that that tradition? Is it going to continue into future generations? Is it on the wane now because of twenty first century madness, or, or <laughs> where do you see it going? Oh gosh, I don't know. I think that I think that the interest in Native Americans is growing. Um, there's a lot more of them. Uh, out in the public, they're mm -hmm. they're starring in roles on TV and in movies, and and they're not just having white people play the natives anymore, yeah. Yeah. you know. And so it's becoming authentic, and um and I really appreciate that. And people are just becoming more aware. I've I've been sharing a lot of things on Facebook for the last month of you know whenever there's a thing about a a chief or a well known. Native American leader, I've been sharing it and getting a lot of feedback about that. And one person said, this is great. It's nice to be able to learn about them and know yeah. them. Awesome. So. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me like in, we don't get a huge amount of it over here in the UK, but every now and then we see like news from New Zealand. Um, and mm -hmm. they've got their their like indigenous like Maui culture, right? Um, right. and you see you've seen increasing like um, you know Maui representation in their political system. And uh, I've seen things like you know so and so is becomes the first politician to have a Maui facial tattoo, right, um, right. and like their prime minister would be using bits of Maui language and things like that to to mm -hmm. kind of reference back to them. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's just just good that we have those, you know, we we want to keep those things so we don't we don't forget them. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree, and and we're seeing a lot more of it here too. Yeah, cool, awesome. So uh, just to wrap things up, this is kind of two questions in one. Um, what's next for you and where can people go to find out more and to get a copy of the book? Well, all, the book is available in all forms on Amazon and Josephine is available on Amazon as well. It's called Josephine, A Tale of Hope and Happy Endings. Um, what's next for me is to finish up this book. It's going to be called Romeo and Me <laughs> by Amelia. <laughs> and um, and I've got a couple other book projects in my head. I just haven't been able to sit down and get them out yet. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm concentrating heavily on the screenplay and getting that project going. Cool. Awesome. Big thank you to Ronnie McFadden for joining me. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And this is Jazz Dylan featuring Henny Envy with Get Your Boots On. No, Get On Your Boots. Same thing, kind of. <laughs>
sat, sat up and looked at the sky Watching, watching the world pass me by Colorblind by Tom Bradley Jr. And before that we had Get On Your Boots by Jazz Dylan featuring Henny Envy. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to head over to the Ilk Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Focal Harlem, Inside Outside. The best of live and in the studio. If there is one record that represents the sound and fashion of 1967 more than any other... It must be White a Shade of Pale by Procol Harum. Matthew Fisher's great swirling bark-like organ, Gary Brooker's big soulful voice, and the intriguing and impenetrable lyrics of Keith Reed. A whole generation who may have forgotten the actual score in the 1966 World Cup final still remember exactly how many Vestal Virgins were leaving for the coast. 
It was Brooker's singing and piano and Keith Reed's lyrics that were the constant in Progal Harem. They never repeated the success of White A Shade Of Pale. The follow-up single Homburg did okay, but some very good songs like Shine On Brightly and The Salty Dog made little impression. In the 70s they became more of a symphonic rock band and made a series of excellent albums. The best bits from these 70s albums are on this compilation, which I seem to remember was ridiculously cheap. It has some great songs, my favourites being Hotel Grand and Strong as Samson. It also has their later hits, Nothing But The Truth and Pandora's Box. I can't say I was much of a Progal Harlem fan back in the day, but listening to the band and the E Street Band and even Mott the Hoople, I started to think that the ultimate rock band lineup might be piano, organ and guitar. The great thing about this compilation is that it has a CD of live material. The album that initially revived their career was a live album recorded with an orchestra. That album contained a version of their song Conquistador, which was a massive improvement on the hastily recorded and underproduced version on their first album. It became a hit and is one of those songs that I never tire of listening to. Also on that album was an operatic version of their song Wailing Stories from one of the earlier albums. This must be one of the most successful of all the rock band and orchestra collaborations. This compilation has both those tracks from that album and also live versions of Shine On Brightly, A Salty Dog, and extended live versions of White A Shade of Pale and Homburg. The only downside is that it does not have the original massive hit single, but even now White A Shade of Pale is probably overplayed and almost impossible to avoid. Procol Harum, Inside Outside. Brian Wilson, Smile. When I was a teenager in the early 70s, I used to live for Thursdays, when I could buy the music press on my way to school. I first became an avid reader of The Melody Maker. I would devour the whole thing looking for news on T-Rex, Led Zepp, Purple, Sabbath or Floyd, but taking in everything else. There was so much about the decline of Brian Wilson, drugs and insanity, a grand piano in a sand pit, and always questions about the great Beach Boys lost masterpiece. Smile. There were stories of how upset he was, that the recording sessions had caused massive tensions in the band, who had just wanted to play surf music and had tired of being his playthings in creating a masterpiece to rival the Beatles. It was said he had created the sound of an inferno, but had burnt the tapes. What we had heard was the groundbreaking single Good Vibrations. It was a song I remember from the radio, but it was only when somebody lent me the single that I realised what a masterpiece it really was. A medley of ideas with the perfect rhyming couplet. I don't know where, but she sends me there. And the grandest of climaxes. We also heard Surf's Up, a truly beautiful piece that turned up years later as the high point on an otherwise inconsistent Beach Boys album. If you search YouTube, there is a performance of the song, performed solo on a piano by Brian Wilson, on a TV show hosted by the great classical and musical theatre composer Leonard Bernstein. In the noughties, Wilson put together his own band. It was members of that band that persuaded him to dig out the old Smile tapes, and together they pieced together Wilson's original concept, re-recording everything afresh. You can hear the wear and tear of bodily abuse and age in Wilson's voice, but the backing vocals are everything you would have expected from the Beach Boys. Without the technical challenges that would have hampered him in 1967, Wilson achieves a bright, clean, well-produced sound. There are the other known songs of Cabin Essence, Vegetables and Heroes and Villains, and there is a version of Good Vibrations, which is even more elaborate than the single but suffers from worse lyrics. And there are songs and incidental pieces in all kinds of styles that all go together to make up one long work that requires to be listened to as a whole. It is a sort of geographical and historic tour of the US, starting in Plymouth Rock 
and taking in the Wild West and ending in California. Smile, Brian Wilson. Chicago Transit Authority. I was always a bit confused by the band Chicago. In the early 70s we had an early evening rock show on Capital Radio hosted by Nicky Horn. It was called Your Mother Wouldn't Like It. It seemed to have a fairly limited playlist, but it did often play 25 or 6 to 4, an amazingly catchy yet savagely hard-rocking single by Chicago. I would also occasionally hear their version of Stevie Winwood's song I Am A Man, which had been a hit for the Spencer Davis group. This was also a monster of a track with horns and seriously distorted heavy lead guitar. On the other hand, Radio 1 would play middle-of-the-road soft rock songs by Chicago like If You Leave Me Now. It was only recently when I watched the documentary about Chicago on Amazon Prime that I realised how the death of Terry Kath, their lead guitarist and leading light, had led to a change into a much softer and more commercial direction, spearheaded by their bass player Peter Cetera. I watch quite a lot of ranking videos on YouTube and I learnt that the first three albums are the ones to go for. And of those, the first one is probably the best. They were originally called Chicago Transit Authority, but after this album they became just Chicago, following a threat of legal action by the real Chicago Transit Authority. So their second album is called Chicago, but the third is called Chicago 3. All the following albums are numbered. Chicago Transit Authority is a great album. It is like they found themselves with a guitars, bass, drums and keyboards band and a horn section and took the best of every kind of music that had ever been performed by that combination of musicians. Elements of Stack's soul with a bit of bassy and Ellington jazz swing, the percussion and fiery lead guitar of Santana, and the funk of James Brown, and the catchy brassy bits of Blood, Sweat and Tears. There are some fantastic songs on this album that you will be humming for days. There are fancy grooves, there are the kind of horn riffs you might have heard on Dexy's Midnight Runners or Earth, Wind and Fire songs, and crazy fuzzbox Hendrix-influenced lead guitar. It does not have 25 or 6 to 4, which is on Chicago's second album. What would have been the final side on vinyl starts with a sample of crowds protesting the Vietnam War and chanting the whole world's watching, reminding us that the late 60s were a time with much to protest about. Chicago Transit Authority by the band that were to become Chicago. Big thank you to Twangle and Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Ronnie McFadden for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me a line on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share, local arts, news, stories to share, etc, etc. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And we are repeated on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune. And this is Esther Hayes with Seven Stars. I'll catch you next week. Seven stars lost their light A burning sun knocked them out with all its blinding, raging might It smashed them apart Like a child with a hammer Unconscious of the damage inflicting of careless actions, careless actions. The stars had to learn the sun wasn't only to blame. The stars had to learn not to let the sun play this game. Seven stars lost their light And with them left the night left the sky night. blind Silly stars should have
have known Should have seen it coming a mile from home Becoming, becoming, becoming The stars had to learn The sun wasn't only to blame The stars had to learn not to let The sun play this game to you matters of the heart and nothing but clutter seven stars lost their light why did they never falter why did they never falter with undivided dedication unaltered they hope for the sun to have changed for this situation to have grown the stars had to learn the sun wasn't only to blame the stars had to learn not to let the sun play this game Let the sun play this game You played a game Always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame Oh, you played a game Always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame For you, I always yearn 